recording. It is the last recording of this class, but it's not your last recording. You have a long life ahead. Of you. <laughs> so, this is not the end. This is just the beginning, right? This is just like your dissertation. Now, um, if you think about it, so we're talking about course evaluations. Now, think about what you've learned in this class and apply it to course evaluations. Right? So how do you analyze course evaluation data usually? Like you have the Likert ratings of your courses. And our department looks at the average, which is like a sum score. Like CPP. Yeah, right? And then <laughs> when you get up to the university level, I've been on, well, it was through the Center for Teaching Excellence. We had discussions about the different ways of doing evaluation. And they'd be like, well, you know, one of the things that hurts us is, you know, there's a clear bias against women in the course ratings, right? And the averages are lower. Now think of that from the perspective of this class. Mm -hmm. If you're talking about a trait score, and it's lower for women, and you can see the average is lower for women, mm -hmm. what would you have to do to check that it's actually lower for women? Invariance test, aren't you? You'd have to go and do some type of measurement invariance to see whether or not the items are specifically different Mm -hmm. Measuring different things for the different type of instructor that you have. Yeah. Furthermore, there might even be a gender by uh, a gender of the rater by gender of the professor mm -hmm. interaction, mm -hmm. which I think mm -hmm. is largely the case as well. Mm -hmm. uh, and believe me, I'm 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 completely sympathetic to those who look at the averages and they're like, yeah, clearly the averages are lower. Yes, they are. The averages. Are, we even have this issue with online versus mm -hmm. pencil and paper. Um, the averages changed. I don't know if they all went lower, they all were, but they were different. But the thing is, they're going to, they fluctuate because mm -hmm. you have different students who come in. So, you know, you think about, think of it this way. You've rated, how many, how many teachers have you rated this year or this class, in this semester? One, two, two, four, three. Okay. So now you're the same rater providing ratings on a bunch of teachers. And the teachers have a classroom effect and you have a rating effect. Now think of design effects, think of methods factors that you'd have to build in to really evaluate this, right? Not only would you have to worry about measurement invariance, you might have to have multiple ratings from the same rater would help you understand whether or not there's a rater issue, mm -hmm. right? And on the same questions. I mean, and all of a sudden you've got a question effect. I mean, so there's, there's lots of, you think just the teaching evaluation, how we do it on campus is a microcosm of SEM, the need for SEM versus like what actually happens in the real world. So is anything going to change uh, with this information? Well, um, no. Sorry. <laughs> change, for this change is terribly slow. Um, it can be fast and can be slow. So this is getting into the, I, I, I'm learning all about the academic hierarchy. Here's the funny thing. All of you have had have degrees of some sort, right? And when you got that degree, you're like, okay, I know everything about that degree now, right? Like academics, for me, every time I get some other milestone, whether it's another label in front of whatever professor I am mm -hmm. or whatever title I'm doing on campus, there's always this unlocks this door to like 18 layers more than what it is. And so in the academic hierarchy, I've learned, okay, as a department, we can choose the questions that we want. We don't have to go with the standard one the university says. But there's... Even if it's on paper, we could do, we could choose paper, we could choose online, we could choose whatever. That's a department level decision. However, for faculty who are going to go for promotion or tenure, the the rumor, the urban legend or the institutional legacy, whatever you want to call it, is that when you send up their materials, if your department's doing it differently than what everybody else is, there's a risk that you hurt your people, your personnel in your department when they get evaluated at the university level. So, for instance, we have this these questions that are on there. By the way, have you seen the questions? They're like double and triple. They're like a they're an exemplar of why to not uh, why to understand measurement because there's multiple things they're asking in each one. It seems like mm -hmm. oh my goodness. By the way, they were created by Todd Little. Part of part of what Todd was doing when he was here. Um, sorry, <laughs> got to de Todd more places. Got to clean it up. Uh, I'm saying that online here too. Um, but no, it's it's a uh, so. If, if everybody's doing it that way, then the people who are evaluating you at the university level are expecting to see it that way. You run the risk of running afoul of them. All they're looking at is the numeric rating. And that's sort of what we do right now for the large part, which is traumatic in lots of ways. We shouldn't just be relying on the numeric ratings. All right, we could talk about more qualitative information. Here, I'm a quantitative researcher. We need, also need more qualitative information about the teacher as well. Uh, we, you know, for, for my promotion last year, I scanned every teaching rating I had 
all the way back to when I started, not even here, I was a, a lecturer for one semester at Illinois. I scanned those in as well, and every one of them, every one, every one of the comments people could look at, I doubt anyone did, because it's, how are you going to evaluate it? Right? I summarized a few of the good comments in my teaching statement, and I, and I encouraged the readers to look through the comments, because it would take a class or two, and I think you'd find a trend, right? And you know, not everything's perfect, but you get a, a sense for it, but... You know, the big fear is that what's holding us back is the fear that the university committee might not understand what we're doing here. And to get promoted or evaluated, you have to go through department and then school and the university. Like, school may not understand, but they're a lot more proximal to us. We know who they are. Right? We can, I can go down a floor and talk to the special ed department. But universities, who the heck's sitting on that, right? Anyway, so yeah, it's, I don't, um, so in that regard, change can happen and I'd love to see change. So that's one of the things, I know it sounds geeky of me, but it's like, you know, as, as I play the role of associate chair, teaching range have been bugaboo of mine and a lot of people on campus for years. Um, the, the Center for Teaching Excellence, I think, was started by Dan Bernstein, who um, Lisa had as a professor when she was an undergraduate at Nebraska, believe it or not. But he was a colleague of mine in psych here. Uh, he's recently retired, but he was his focus was on a portfolio rather than just numeric evaluation for this reason. Mm -hmm. Totally agree. It's gone nowhere, and then, and then he was talking about it in 2005 when I started. Well, that's how teachers are evaluated. Yeah. And that's kind of the weird part is that you can be a teacher and you're evaluated a certain way all the time because that's what the union decides, and then you get to be a professor and it's like, no, 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 we're going to do it very different and in a way that actually probably will paint a different picture. And not only that, we're teaching the teachers. Yeah. <laughs> this is school of ed, right? The teacher education program. <laughs> It's one of the best ones in the nation. So. Yeah, we're, we're preparing teachers with this. Oh, sorry, it's just, yeah. it's crazy. No, so I'd like to, and as part of my like geekiness of being an associate chair, I'd like to um, to do more of the, the numeric analysis on the backside. And basically what I want to show is it's crap. The numbers are should not be believed at all. Mm -hmm. and that, that's where I'm going with. That's my, of course I'm biased, but that's my hypothesis. Mm -hmm. My hypothesis is not going to work well. Now, if I can, if it works well, I you know falsify that hypothesis even better. But let's be honest, it's not probably not going to work too well. So it, it's a weird position because you're the one that's being evaluated. So you saying that those are biased, it's like kind of takes away the credibility. Unless you have really high teaching evaluation scores, then it would be like, well, you know, even somebody that's doing well in this system believes that there's a major flaw. Yeah, I, and I think, I don't know, I, my, I don't know where my scores, I, I rarely look at the numeric score anymore. I look at the, the written comments, and I try to be sensitive to each comment. The negative ones are the ones I try to adapt to. The positive ones certainly help. Believe me, if I read a lot of negative ones, it's harder. Get a little positive feedback with, with the negative ones. But I think, uh, you know, I look at it as constructive criticism. So, anyway, yeah, it's a long story short. I'm rambling. <laughs> The teaching evaluations, uh, again, this, this is sort of our summary class, our culminating class. I'm trying to think of, wrap this into a teaching moment. Think of how you do it with the tools you learned in this semester mm -hmm. and how that might change. And then if you try to present that, like when I tried to talk, I did mention this. Hey, you know, the, the way that you can't believe the results. I mean, I said, first of all, I, I, I sort of actually do believe there is a bias. First of all, the means for female teachers are, are lower, right? I, I get that. I can see that. And and I could say, I can argue okay yeah there might be a methodological flaw with that but I I suspect there's probably something going on right but let's make it a stronger argument let's talk about why that is or better yet are there certain ways of asking or is there an interaction effect is there some gender by like you said you know male female female male ratings or something like that that caused this uh, study it more rather than just say it's worse I don't know anyway I'll stop anybody everybody get pizza please eat as much as you can. Eat more. Smells good, at least. I was telling Craig this. I was in a dissertation proposal until like 11.40. I told them to get here at 11.45. think they'd be like 10 minutes late. So it was either 11.45 or noon. And I thought 10 minutes late would be good for class. And they were here a little bit early. And as I'm walking down this side of the hallway, I'm just catching whiffs of like, <laughs> like someone had just walked by, but I can't see the guy with all the pizzas. I'm like... He's here. I hope he's not going to like, <laughs> so I'm like trying to, like sniffing my way down the hallway and I come in there he is. Okay. Are there extra plates? Uh, I don't know. Plates, anybody? Plates or napkins? Anybody have extras? Um, there's napkins. That's for sure. Well, I'm sorry if there's not enough plates. Well, I know. Yeah, you go. There you go. Yeah, go ahead. 
Go ahead. All right. So anybody else have questions or anything before we uh, officially begin? Stop that. Comments, questions, thoughts? Okay. The um, What I'm going to talk about today is sort of the end of class. What if you can't do SEM? Say what? Why am I teaching this class? Ah, uh, yes. It's also a, a kind of a glimpse of to... There are lots of situations you might come into in your life where you can't do SEM very easily. Um... First of all, let's start. Why would you want to do SEM in the first place? What is the rationale for it? <clears throat> Latent variables. So you're doing some type of linear model with things that are not observed. What could go wrong? So you could have model misspecification. Yeah. Okay, that's one. So if you put in, if you sum up a bunch of items without checking their model fit, they may not accurately represent the trait someone has, right? That's one. That's good. So if you put that into a regular like regression, you're saying that let's say um, achievement predicts high school graduation rate with you know, more probability someone graduates high school with like a logit regression. What's going to happen? Your achievement variable is biased. The regression isn't going to meet this, right? Okay, let's let's imagine that you do. Let's imagine that your model fits great. What else could go wrong? Sample size could be too small. Nah, maybe. That's not really an issue. That's going to haunt SEM probably more than it's going to haunt not using it. I have a. This is a lecture. I did not put in hours, but I have. I have a scorecard of what can go wrong. Let's see if I can do this. I was trying to make this like uh, miniature golf. There's no way, no way to play miniature golf in Lawrence. There we go. Here is the error scorecard. Oh, there is. What's that? Oh, there is? Mm -hmm. Oh, wait. It's indoors now. Yes. Mm -hmm. Have you been there? No. No. I'm thinking. Yeah. I like that place. I take it, I've taken my daughter there when she's come. It's not bad. It's, they have laser tag. They kind of like that. Okay. The, the indoor course is not... It's not championship level, but <laughs> no, I, I say that because um, there's this course out where I'm from in Roseville, California, that has like the hard. It's like the hardest miniature golf course. Every every like hole has some type of jump or some type of water hazard or something else that people lose balls all the time, right? And it's just it's really frustrating. And my sisters and I have this family, this sibling rivalry, because I I kicked their butt for thirty years, right? <laughs> so like. Like when I was like I don't know, it was like in my mid thirties, thirty three or something like that, and my sister finally won, <laughs> and I was like, this can't be. But you know, anyway. So yeah, so, <laughs> but it was only on the championship level course. Okay. okay. All right. So what what could happen here? Uh, we could have here's the big one everybody usually talks about though: measurement error. When you have a latent variable, that la latent variable is not likely to have reliability of one. And it's very clear what happens when you don't have reliability of one and you put a, a, a variable without re perfect reliability into a regression. The regression slopes are downward biased when it's a predictor. When it's an outcome, it's a little harder to say. You're supposed to be error increases. Um, the other part that very few people talk about, although there's a paper, I think, by Bruno Zumbo recently that described this, is that you also get a um, an issue with... Um, uh, standard errors also get too small, right? So it's like saying if your regression slope looks smaller than it should, you're like, well, it's it's more conservative that way. But it turns out the hypothesis test tends to be biased, have inflated type one error because not only is the slope smaller, standard error is a lot smaller depending on how reliability works, right? So. I'm pizza. Yeah, please have some pizza. I didn't bring the I didn't bring any alcohol though. So it's just pizza <laughs> there. So. Um, so here's what can go wrong. Here's the sort of the list I came up with when I was trying to put this down a couple years ago. Measurement error, number one. Let's think of it as reliability. Your things aren't reliable, bad. Sampling error, that's the small sample size, right? You can always have sampling error, but turns out the sum score, if you just add things up, 
is probably less prone to it because there's fewer parameters, right? It's just sort of just locked in. You still can have sampling error, but it's harder to see. Um, it could be the case, what's a posterior distribution? Well, we're assuming that the factor scores are normally distributed. If we put a factor score in. So this is like if you, so what is this coming from? The two columns, sum score and factor score. Some, if you're going to use, if you had two options to put a number into a regression afterwards, what would happen? What would go wrong if you tried either of these, right? If you just output, if you added up items and used a sum score versus doing a, like a unidimensional measurement model and outputting the factor score. So, so let's imagine, I, I'm not going to do SEM for whatever reason, and my choices are I can, do, I can do a CFA and output the factor score, or I could just sum up the items about the sum score. What, what, what happens where? Well, if, you, if you're worried about measurement error, both of those, the red says both of those are suspect to measurement error. Sampling error, I think, is less an issue in a sum score. And again, because the parameters are locked in, they're sort of equal. There's less fewer parameters. We, we saw before the parallel items model give you the same result as a sum score. So if you think about it, if, if the measurement model for it has two parameters in the continuous case. There's uh, one factor loading and one uh, residual variance. Whereas in the factor score, if you're doing a, the, what we call the congeneric model, where every item gets its own factor loading and every item gets its own residual variance, there's a lot more parameters, right? So, so sum score versus factor score, that's where sampling error, fewer parameters means a little bit better precision on the estimate of that. Posterior distribution bias, that's saying, what is the impact of assuming something about the score going in? Well, in the sum score, we assume nothing. It's just added up. In the factor score we assume a normal distribution, most likely, which when we output the factor score, the number of items is small. You see the, uh, the, the scores get pushed toward the middle, uh, squished, I like to call it. If this is a normal distribution. The outlying scores kind of get pushed in a little bit more. They're, they, get called, they get called shrunken estimates. Uh, I'm, actually, I'm wondering, why, why is that? Because knowing that the maximum likelihood estimation would not would like to go for infinity huh oh guess it's not infinity that's exactly it. so the problem is we when you have a if you the factor score when you assume the factor score has, factor has whatever distribution when you output the score that assumption gets brought with it and mm. so if you have for each person the, the the data that you have there a version of the sampling error is how many items you ask them so if you have a just identified model with three three items Right, the, the that that factor that assumption of the distribution factor is going to be almost like a, a quarter of the information contributing. It's going to be big. If you have a measurement model with a hundred items, though, it's going to be like very small. So the more items that you get, essentially, the better information. The, the it minimizes the impact of having that prior distribution. Uh, the ML estimator bias. Well, that can happen if um, you know, some score again. Not there. What is the ML estimator bias and factor score? Well, the factor score itself, um, we can have, when we were estimating with ML, um, if we were just to estimate a regression model with it, what we'd find is our variance estimate is too small. Remember in um, basic statistics, how you there were two versions of the standard deviation. There was one that was divided by N and one that was N minus one. And sometimes you learn one, the N was the population and the other was the sample. Well, in ML, we're effectively using population, right? And so there's an inherent bias that downweights variance when we use ML or, um, what's I gonna say robust ML? Robust ML might correct it, but if you're using straight ML, it's a problem, so. Uh, what is this MSPFD? So, also, so, is that also related to the, the, the embedded threats in the maximum likelihood estimation that it might uh, not deal effectively with the missing data? Or no, that, that's not necessarily it. Um, missing data is another bias so, you could have if it's not missing at random, which is a little bit better than missing completely at random. Actually, if I were to, I needed to put, that's another column I should have, missing data. Missing data will end up hurting the sum score more than the factor score. Mainly because to do the sum score, you have to assume missing completely at random. And to the factor score with ML estimation, you assume a, a little bit weaker assumption, which is missing at random. So it's a little bit better for data protection. But both of them will bias, potentially bias things. 
Uh, I'm what is model misspecification errors? That's what this is. Model misspecification. I don't know what MSPFD stands for. I, for, I was crazy when I wrote these slides, so I just completely blanked out. It was like that was like three years ago, two and a half years ago. Templin. <laughs> it is, yeah, and I can I can put these up under our like additional materials for this class. Um, where so this is what Jesse was talking about. What if your model doesn't fit? There's all sorts of ways the model may not fit. It may not fit with the number of dimensions. It may not fit with the constraints. So, so in a factor score, in theory, you should be able to fix, be able to get information that can help you fix it. Right. So, if you output a factor score from a model that fits, it removes you from having to worry about the dimensionality because you can tell it fits the data. The constraints. Well, on a, remember, a sum score constrains the factor loadings to be equal, the residual variances to be equal. So the sum score is a suspect to that, whereas the factor score wouldn't because if you did that and you tried the factor model and it didn't fit, you'd probably change the constraints. So that's fine too. The linear prediction function, what does that mean? <clears throat> um, again, if the factor score, if you think of what we're doing with the factor score, even in IRT or CFA, the, the part that's doing the business, there's intercept or threshold plus loading times factor. But what if it's nonlinear? Right? What if it's what if it's a quadratic relationship between the factor and the item? Right? Well, again, I think because of model fit, you should be able to pick up on that. Right? So that's why I say the factor score probably protects you against it, whereas the sum score, you have no idea. Right? The last two, the data distribution, neither of these work well for. What if you're using CFA and you shouldn't be? Ooh. Right? Oof, that's not good. Um, so, right? I have a question. Yeah, yeah. And I have been thinking about it like for a long time. So, having exposed, having been exposed <coughs> to different types of measurement class and statistical mm -hmm. technique, what I am trying to, because there is, I'm not clear about it, but. I feel like we are dealing essentially with two distribution, mm -hmm. like for the uh, CFA. Mm -hmm. Essentially, we know that the trait is normally distributed as a trait. <laughs> yeah. So we are building a scale to measure, to kind of trying to measure that trait. Mm -hmm. So there is a distribution here and there is a distribution there. And the, the distribution, like this, the scale distribution, would be different than the uh, trait distribution in, in, in terms of uh, the scale, building the scale, mm -hmm. the scale characteristics. Are we dealing with the trait distribution or the scale distribution? distribution? Well, it depends on what you call the scale. It's the numbers that you're talking about, right? And so remember... So, like, for example, let us say, go, go first with, uh, like, go from this class. Like, we have, like... Uh, Likert scale with, mm -hmm. with uh, three three options. categories. Uh -huh. Three categories. Oh, so that's the I, that's the data itself. The, the data, the scale. The ah, okay, data. yes, okay. So that's we're dealing with both in this class, right? Because we had CFA, which said there's continuous, mm -hmm. and we had I or a T or I, IFA, which said there were categories. But in both of them, we know the trait is normally distributed. That's right. That's right, and that's where they're in different in, places. In places. This this one where it's called prior distribution bias. That's for the factor, the trait normally distributed, this data distribution is for the items themselves, right? So you have to worry about both. You've got to get them both right to be really accurate, I think. Although the factor distribution, I think, is less of, a, of an issue. So I understand. when you say you have to get them both accurate, or better, let us say, so in the I, in the IRT case, we would have like uh, normally distribution trait mm -hmm. factors factor trait or factor uh, distribution. Why we would have like uh, uni um, uh, 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 binomial distribution for the uh, like items the, for the items. For the scale, you can do that, yeah. So here we have. It's fine, but you have to make sure that the items are probably going to be more right. Then, the question is: is the is the trait right? 
is that the factor isn't really normally distributed. It's some type of skewed distribution. The normal distribution is going to push the top end more, right? It's going to make it let, look a little bit less skewed, and the results are going to be maybe shifted a little bit because of it. But hold on, hold on to that thought. We can talk more about, about it afterwards. We just let's just go through what the rest of these happen to be. So again, data distribution is: did you pick the right distribution for the data? The big one that we saw here is continuous versus categorical, but it could still be the same thing. Are you using? Do you really have a count variable that has like seven categories? Are you going to use a multinomial distribution or a Poisson or something along those lines. The factor distribution is also there. If it's not normal, if it's something that's skewed or if it's something that's there's really only two values of people, that could impact things. It could impact the distance between scores, right? Or it could impact the variable. It will impact what you do with the scores when you're done with them is what's happening. So neither of these is perfect. And the thing I was going to talk about is that as a scorecard, you want to do classical test theory and add up, look, there's three green here and three green here, right? But really, they're sort of on a sliding <clears throat> scale. Some of these are sources of errors are much more egregious than others. And the big ones to me are the data distribution and measurement error. Those are the ones that are the, the tough ones to get around. Without those, uh, if, you, if, you just, if you screw those up, the estimate that you're going to get is maybe off. So if I flip to the slides that we have here, there are ways that you could, why would you want to be outputting the scores in the first place? Well, there's ways SCM may not work for you. And some of you have seen this with your data. Um, <laughs> convergence, right? If, if Levon said it didn't converge. You've, there's usually something wrong with the model. I wouldn't say wrong. It's usually like an empirical identification. Like the, Maybe you had two factors and they were so highly correlated that it just blew up literally like they couldn't get off of that uh, you could have small sample sizes relative to the number of estimated parameters that happens to break us in Levon sometimes too it's worse in the categorical data than it is with the continuous so, so that was my question was that was that is that can that be a problem when you get too many categories oh yes absolutely then you then you don't have it yeah because if you have like for your data you had 99, 99 categories right to, to really figure those out you need at least someone in each of them and most likely more than one in each of them. Yeah. So I guess in a lot of our stuff, what they're doing is they're taking like this like classic categorical data mm -hmm. and then they're putting it on like the zero to 99 scale. So mm -hmm. kind of like pretending that it's continuous. Mm -hmm. But I guess I'm trying to figure out then like what do you do with that? Ah, right. So so for, for you, I mean, Levon isn't really going to help you. I treated this continuous to begin with. What it's more likely to happen is if you have, I, I feel like, and are people like, is it a slider bar or is it like on, online? You can pick like 48, but you don't know that it's 48. There's no like. All right. So you're just sort of in between. So that's going to show up as error. It's more of a continuous. The part where I would hesitate to say completely normal is if you have things that people are all the way on the, the top far end of the slider or on the other, you, what you need is really kind of a triple type of distribution, right? You need a probability there at the lower end, some type of continuous deal in the middle, and then there's some other probability there at the higher end, a higher end. And when you do all of that, there's, I mean, M plus has a, there's things called hurdle models that might do it, or sensor data that might do this. You can sometimes call them two or three part models that do this as well. Um, and so what you're get effectively for each item then is three measurement equations. Kind of like in our uh, categorical data, we have these sub models. In the measurement equations would be kind of the, the measurement equation for probability that someone's at the high end. Well, that'd be like a logit, and they'd have that one that's the probability of someone's at the low end, and so you'd have that too. And then what's left over would be someone in the middle, and you could do normal or beta or something. So you'd have three measurement equations, and each would sort of conditionally describe where their data might lie. Um, and even that may not be in that great because you may have items where people are not at the poles, right. which what I would probably think the, the normal is probably going to be a pretty good approximation for. So it's tough. That, your data are interesting, certainly. They're, they're kind of, I think they'd be fun to play with, but later. <clears throat> um, <laughs> there, there could be a minimum estimate. The outcomes could be non-normal. Um, you could have many latent variables included. So that this combination right here, if you wanted to do maximum likelihood estimation and you had non-normal outcomes and lots of latent variables, uh, if you go to M plus to do this, 
and even if you're in even if you're in Merton IRT like here in, in R, it's really difficult to get things to estimate quickly because the way it does the estimation process in maximum likelihood is integrating across each of the latent variables uh, numerically, which means it's this crazy complicated process. The more latent variables you have, the number of steps it takes per person per iteration is exponentially higher. So if you've got five latent variables, you might be waiting 10 hours to get a result. All right, so that's a problem too. You may have the factors are not well identified. You may have too few of indicators on it, or you could have the other problem that the factors are so highly correlated that things start to break. There could be latent variable in, in interactions. All right, there's all sorts of stuff that could just break your, your thing. So what do you do then? So this is where you, uh, that's where I was saying before, well, one of the things you, you talk about is really to do that structural equation model, we were doing things simultaneously. What if you broke it into parts, right? So you have, remember the last example, we had like three measurement models, right? What if we just did each of the three measurement models, we usually can get something to work with them, output a factor score. Now I have these three factor scores, it's just a regression or a multivariate, like a path model with observed variables. What do I do? Right, and that's where we get into the idea of that's the, that's the factor score right there. Or the alternative, which is what you can do with pretty much every other survey research, which is put the sum score in. Right, and this is where the problems lie with just using those. But I think the biggest issue that I think about is me in, in measurement error, that's the thing that we can sort of get around though. And then in sampling error, we can get around too. There's all these types of error that we can probably get around with other methods, and that's where these methods are going to pop in right here. So here is one of the things. We could do a simpler measurement model. No. <laughs> um, here we go. Option number one. Let's imagine you were able to get the measurement models to work unidimensionally. You could do what are called single indicator models. Say what now? <laughs> right? Single indicators. Oh boy. What is a single indicator? Is ASU, uh, it's not Arizona State. It's Arizona. Add stuff up. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, add stuff up. That's a, Lisa's much more willing to drop the S-bomb in class, but, uh, well, I mean, your ratings might be out there. No, I'm just, just kidding. Um, it is it is the add, uh, add stuff up rather than go that way. How about I pull up this and give you some drawing, which you're probably like, oh, no, not drawing. <laughs> but what is a single indicator model? Well, let's imagine this. Uh, we knew before in a factor analysis, here's our factor, mm -hmm. right? And how if we just had one factor, we needed three variables to identify it, right? Right, x1, x2, and x3. Ta-da! And each of these might have some type of residual variance, right? E1, E2, E3, right? And I'm just not giving you great notation here. A single indicator is exactly as it sounds. Here's a factor. Here's x1. That's what we're going to do. What? How would you do that? Well, you can make it work mathematically if you say, I know everything about the variable. Right? So if I say, for instance, this would be x1 equals mu1 plus lambda f plus error, right? And error, this thing, is normally distributed with some, you know, yeah, so it's mean of zero and a unique variance size, uh, size squared, right? If you, for instance, go and say, oh, well, I'm going to do the following. What did we say the factor? The factor itself, we said it was normal. And it had some type of mean for the factor, that's an F, equals, and some type of variance for the factor. And we had to set these before, right? What if we do the following? What if we just go and say, the mean here, right here, is zero, right? <laughs> there it is, yeah. right? Uh -huh. And then what if we go and say, nah, that factor loading is one. <laughs> All right, and then we go and say, oh, well, this this right here is the sigma squared for x one. Actually, no, actually, actually, no, no, no. Pardon me. This 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 right here is something people set to zero too, and the reason why they do that is because up here, when you do all that in the program, what happens is 
you have to set the factor being, and this becomes the mean of x1 bar, bar, and this becomes the variance of x1. So now it's like saying I've tricked my structural equation model to have a factor that's really just my item. Isn't that like the shadiest thing? It's pretty shady. It's pretty shady because it relies on sample estimates for these things and they're not part of the estimation process. But here's what people do with that single indicator. If you have a, vari a variable that's not perfectly reliable, what they want this to be is the reliable part of the variance for it, right? And so what is the reliable part? Well, it happens to be rho times sigma squared x. Right, so they downweight the factor variance by the amount of reliability you have, saying basically, you know, if you can go and get an out, if you get some type of single indicator and you know the reliability is 0.8, then you know the variance of the factor is something like eight tenths of the size of the variance in total. Like, is it, if you remember the uh, sigma x squared is equal to sigma squared for the factor or the true score plus sigma squared error, right? Back in the classical test theory thing, and that's how we found reliability. So the way that we can make all this work out is if we just, what we want to put up here is sigma squared f. And so we work the math backwards and we see if we have a reliability point. What it works out to be is that we just take the reliability, yes, the reliability of it, and put it in as the factor score. And when you do that, what ends up happening is this thing right here, sigma squared x, is one, the other part, the error part of it, times what's left over. All right, so basically you're dividing up it, yeah. So, so the correlation is, is rho times the standard deviation of y over the standard deviation of x. That's right. So this rho times the variance of x. Yeah. I mean, sorry, where, where is <coughs> Rho is really reliability coefficient here. Oh, this isn't rho. Okay. And, so, and, and we know where that's going to come from. That's like Cronbach's alpha. Right, mm -hmm. So we just, someone calculated reliability and we're going to believe it and we're going to put it in there. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that's not the row of correlation, sorry. No. So what, what, what this is doing, though, is if you think about what you would do if this variable was just put in fully in the analysis, then you'd have all of its variance here acting as the factor variance, when really you need to partition it. You need to make some error and some with factor, and that's what that does. So that is a pitch for why you do a single indicator model. Ouch. Not cool. So on the scale of okay to terrible, this is pretty close to terrible? This is the one of the worst options. <laughs> yeah. I mean, mainly, mainly because a couple things. You have to do two analyses. One, to get these values. Well, these values are going to be estimated with error, too. And your reliability coefficient, well, if you didn't do a measurement model for it... Exactly. So where did it come from? So it's probably not going to work too well. The other part is, another thing you could do, parcel. What does parcel mean? Add stuff up. <clears throat> but only for some of them. That's right. <laughs> Find the ones that don't work well. I have an example of parceling in my other class. I won't pull it up. Where I took, I took like the 24 item GRI that didn't fit well, and I parceled 20 of the items, making a five item scale with four regular items and one that was the sum of 20. And it fit almost perfectly. <laughs> right? Ta da! Problem solved. <laughs> this is also pretty terrible. Don't do that either. Right? Parceling is totally cheating and you shouldn't do it. Sorry. The reason why that's there is because one of my, a certain colleague I keep referencing used to always have talks that were why this is not cheating and why you should be doing it. Why, why multiple imputation is not cheating and we should be doing it. Why parceling is not cheating. And that was like the title of a lot of the, like the colloquia we had when I, when I knew this guy. So anyway, yeah. I have a quick yeah. So we have a measure that um, was recently validated with parceling. And um, so there's seven constructs mm -hmm. within it, and then each one just like nicely, perfectly has like three items within each one. So it's a 21 item measure. Okay. I mean, to have that happen would be like, you know, kind of like the best outcome possible. Yeah, I think so. And I don't know. I guess like, wouldn't that be 
a reason to like look into it a little bit more, or is it just kind of assumed like, oh well, I'm sure they did something with numbers. But depends on who you have. It depends on who you have for a reviewer, certainly. And if the fit's perfect, yeah, that's a something's going on. Mm -hmm. It's plausible. It works really well. I don't know. So I don't know the specific enough specifics of it to know where I'd want to go and nitpick a little bit. <clears throat> the first thing I would say is take that model if it's a CFA model, go run it where you within each parcel you fix the factor loadings to be equal and the unique variances to be equal and see if it fits just as well. It likely won't, and that's your test of the parcel, believe it or not. You can use that hmm. as a, a test to see whether parceling is, should be used to improve model fit. It's not really well known by the people who parcel. In fact, I've mentioned that story of the colleague at, at the, the really exclusive quant conference that got really angry when I mentioned that might be the case, and like, you don't want to mention this to them, but that, that is a testable model, I think. If you, again, I, if, you, if you believe the connection I showed you here, which was constraining the the you know constraining the the factor loadings i mean there's the one issue with it is that those are not exactly um you have to make lower order factors of those effectively right and you have to have those be uncorrelated with each other but i think you could test that model test whether or not you should have parceled there and what you'll see with it more often than not is model fit will be terrible because you'll have the same degrees of freedom that you would have yeah. from the model before this whole Here's Lisa describing the degrees of freedom issue in her slides right here. Like if you if you had 12 indicators but switched them down to three parcels, right? You went from having 54 degrees of freedom, which is where remember that's that covariance matrix, the parameters getting stretched to try to fill, compared to zero in the parcel model, right? Where it's or or in your case, with seven items versus 21, yeah. it'd be a lot more <coughs> degrees of freedom. So I think what you'd see to test it is that. And then, I mean, so, like, the other part of it is if it doesn't fit, it usually indicates there's some other type of dimensionality happening. And that may be informative. I mean, so, so anyway, yes. Not to, not to bash it. I, I haven't seen it. I can't. It could be right. It's possible it fits. And if it fits, fine. You have evidence for it. But right now, it's not. There's no evidence to substantiate it. But if you go past that first phase of, like, now this is the 21-item model, like, this is the measure... You never really revisit that part again. You just like accept the parceling and yes. then move on. And that's the logical inconsistency with parceling, which is, oh, 21 didn't fit, but now I'm going to do the same 21 items, reconfigure them, and it fits fine now. Let's just move on, right? Yeah. It, it, it's, uh, it's silly. It's, it really is. A, it's like a, it's someone playing like the shell game, I feel like, you know, like <laughs> or three card Monty or whatever they call it, right? Where they're, you know, you're going to lose every time. It's that. It's like, well, yeah, see, I did model fit and it worked. And here's my substantive rationalization of the parcel. These three things have to be added up because, and enter rationale based on empirical theory here. And then, oh yeah, that makes sense. But really, it's a testable hypothesis, I think. So, anyway, so parceling, totally cheating. Can you use factor scores? Probably not. So here's the bigger issue. Doing anything with single variables is bad. Why is it bad? And that was where measurement error comes in. Right? So measurement error is always there when you have one variable that has error, but you treat it like it doesn't. So you output the factor score, you know there's error involved with it. Put it in a model that doesn't have a place for error to go, and what happens? Good. The, the, the first counter to that was the single indicator, by the way. The single indicator, at least, allowed you to put some error into the item. Oops. Right over here. Put some error into the item and some, the rest into the factor. So that sort of helped a little bit, but then you had to have accurate estimates of everything. That turns out not great. So those are the simple options, and they're not really good. You ready for the fun ones? Fun one, see Jesse. What if you go and output multiple factor scores? And instead of providing one score per person, you provide a handful of them. So this is where this comes from. Um, there's a large data set that we use in educational measurement called NAEP, National Assessment of Educational Progress. Uh, and if you go look this data set up, you can actually go through a data training and 
sign a data agreement and you'll get access to the data. And for each person, they don't give you one score for the test. They use IRT to calibrate it. They give you five. And those five scores are called plausible values. So think of it this way. For each person's factor score, this is factor score for a person. Yeah. No, don't be a sorry. I want to see this. This is great stuff. I appreciate it. Thank you. No, I'm glad that you told me. I'm just. This is great stuff. <laughs> I'm just more making mocking myself. So imagine if so if if the factor score for a person, if you give a person this score right here, but if they have error on it, as the number of items goes to infinity, the distribution of that score looks like this, right? So what you've done is when you give a factor score, you've smushed that whole distribution into that one line, right? So the idea behind plausible values was why don't we just sample five scores at random from this distribution, right? And so now every person does not get represented by one score. They're represented by five. And in my secondary analysis, if I have a regression model, my data set is five times as long, right? So each person has five scores. But the weight of each five score is really one fifth of a person. And so in regression analysis, I'm pretty sure you didn't learn this because I don't know if I've ever taught it before in regression, but there's a way to do a weighted version of regression where each data observation gets a weight. So you weight by one fifth or however many, you weight by one over the number of plausible values you get per person. And when you do that, uh, you look at the total degrees of freedom, it matches your sample size. If you look at, or I guess n minus one, whatever degrees of freedom might be in your output. So it syncs up, it doesn't overcount people. But what you've done with that is effectively represent a person in five different spots, right? So what, what, what do you think about what happens? If, if we're going to go put f into a regression, let's wait, we're going to predict y with it, right? y for a person equals beta one or beta zero plus beta one f plus error. And think about what's going to happen with this distribution, right? If we had uh, f over here predicting y, we would have if we had one output. If this is person one, imagine this is person one right here. That's their data point, say right there, All right? Well, really, what's going to happen is now their data points are going to be something like this, All right? And we might have a person two over here that does similarly, right? Right? And so now this regression line kind of goes to the middle of these things, kind of looks like that. Whereas if I output the mean for it, it'd be kind of in the middle here. The mean might be more like this. So it changes the effect of the regression line. It leverages it in different ways. But it offsets the issue of measurement error because it's sampling from. You're allowing the factor to change. And really what this really is doing, if you think of multiple imputation methodology, this is a multiple imputation on the factor. We're just sampling from the range of values we think it might be. Take the, the final, put what we call the posterior distribution of the factor and draw. Is this enough just for five? No, I wouldn't think so. But the reason why it's five is because in 1992, <clears throat> five was a lot for computing. Oh. Now there's no reason to have like anything less than a thousand. Just, you know, it doesn't make a difference. I mean, it takes a little bit of time to trans. I haven't shown you how to do this in R. And I have, and this is part of the reason why this is the end, but I just had to get through everything else. But you could do this in theory to make this work. So when you sample like 1,000, mm -hmm. this distribution would have one, only one value that would be really representative of that distribution. No, you have all 1,000 is going, you're basically so, getting, you're getting so, all, a whole set from that, right? And most of them are going to come from this middle part, but some might come from the outlying parts. Right? It's a random process. And then when you go do the regression analysis, really what you've done, everybody has the same y. It's thought to be observed perfectly. But x has changed. You know, you've got this spread of x for people. So each one is putting different pressure onto the regression point. And if most of them are in the middle here, you'll see it, its information for that regression line is going to be tied to that middle part rather than being pushed or pulled by where a random process might be or where the mean might be and like smushing it. So. So what you end up getting though is, is a is a better a better accounting for measurement error because of this. This can this can remove the influence of measurement error from your process. Does that sound interesting to you?
Wait, so are you saying that option four is the one to go? Not yet. Okay. <laughs> it gets better. Okay, great. Not quite yet, actually, I should say. Because if you look at Lisa's slides, I think she puts her example in here. Nope, she didn't. Um, one of her examples that I think I have on our, our, our website, I believe I put it up there, does this. And it tries to compare and contrast the different options. The M plus does multiple, the plausible value very easily. Mm -hmm. Levon doesn't done it yet, but we can easily do it in Levon with a couple extra functions. I could write them, and if you want to do this, I can help you with it in your own code or whatever else. For your own research, that is. This is not a class project. Um, this thing, uh, the the Nate, where, where this came from with Nape, I mean, it's, Nape is the one I know of. There's probably other places it came from. NAEP has this, they sample hundreds of thousands of people. I got one of their data sets once. And it has, I was doing a model with 300,000 some odd observations, right? So, so when you have 300,000 some odd observations, if we go back to our scorecard, what's the issue with that? Sampling error is no longer there because you've got a massive sample. Well, Lisa did this example in her, her examples. Let's see if I can... I probably can't pull it up. Eh, maybe. Let's go to You know, I may not have uh may not have put it on there. Yeah, I don't know that I put it on there. But if if uh it may be on our website, it may not be, I don't know. Anyway, point being, let's just describe it and if you want more information, send me an email and I'll try to find it for you. Um, she had a sample of, I think, 150 people, which is very realistic for the type of research she's in, right? And she did plausible values, and she compared, kind of, and she, I think she knew, she had, she had the, she was trying to compare everything to the SEM estimates, and the plausible values were the furthest apart from it. <coughs> so they look really bad, but that's the impact of sampling error. When you have a small sample size, what's happening is each one of the, Factor loadings or each one of the discriminations, they all have standard errors. And so it's like saying you're when you when you go and output a factor score or you draw this posterior distribution of the factor for a person, right here, this distribution, it relies upon the parameter estimates from the model you estimated. But if there's huge standard errors around them, such that, you know. You, you kind of get the middle of that distribution, but there might be some wiggle room. That wiggle room gets shunted, right? You, you focus the parameter into that small value. And what you end up doing is if you allowed, if you allowed the parameters to wiggle, what you would actually see is this factor distribution should have even more error to it. Because the parameter, you don't know where the parameters are certainly, right? So the impact of sampling error on the factor distribution is that it's, you have even less certainty about the factor than you would if you fixed all the parameters at their most likely estimates, ignored the standard errors for each of them, like they're zero, and done this. So NAEP gets away with this because they have, with a sample size of like 300,000, their standard errors go out to like five decimal places, right? It's effectively zero. So the impact of sampling error is negligible. But when so, you have... So what you are talking about here is the factor score for the whole uh, sample or for each person? For each person. Each person's going. The whole sample will have a widening effect of it, but each person's specific distribution that you draw a plausible value from, we widen because of it as well. It's kind of like classical test theory, like it's because classical test theory is kind of the same logic. Not quite. I, I don't see it, but hang on. Let me let me just describe it real quick. If you say I've got lambda one, lambda two, and lambda three, and from these, for person one, I get this distribution. And for person two, actually here, there's person two, right? <clears throat> but if lambda one, if that's just one value of it, if I took a different value of lambda one, let's imagine lambda one really ranged between, you know, uh, negative or uh, 0.5 and three. Let's imagine that's its confidence interval, right? And let's imagine I take the mean value for it, which would be what, 1.75, kind of the average? If I were to go and just take a sample of lambda one, if I were to replicate this and just have a sampling error happen, I might have a lambda one that'd be higher, right? And so now I put that there, and if lambda one's higher, what it's gonna represent is these little distributions are gonna get it a little narrower. 
right? Rel I guess it's relative. I had the same sigma square. If I had the same sampling or residual variance or error variance. Now, but if I pick the other way around, they're going to get wider. So the aggregate of it is that really what you're doing when you fix your parameters, if you've got measurement error, I'm sorry, sampling error, is that you're underestimating the tails of the factor distribution as well. So you want to know the solution to that, which is the solution to everything these days for me. Use Bayesian. So it happens. Ta-da! Ta now I haven't talked about Bayesian. I don't know, I have like 15 minutes. I don't think I can give you a whole class on Bayesian right now. But what Bayesian does, it, its estimation process takes a long time, but at each step in the chain, all the parameters get some value. Right? So step one. Here's the parameters. So it's like saying what it's doing is if you took the factor scores that came out from that, because the lambdas are allowed to wiggle around, the factor score distribution should be a little wider because the as the lambdas are wiggling around, you're getting this wider or smaller factor score distribution. You're getting variation in the factors themselves. And so long as you don't see, bay, there's all sorts of bays. And I'm talking about bays with very diffuse, very uninformative prior, something that would look like a maximum likelihood result. What it allows the parameters to do is essentially you're plausible valuing the parameters while you're plausible valuing the factor scores. Right? I mean, you could, that's another solution to this too. You could do maximum likelihood, take a look at the parameter estimates, draw a sample of them, and then draw a sample of the factor score, right? That, it's the same process. But then, if you do that process, you, you check off the measurement error and the sampling error from the list as well. And those are two big ones to me for, fix, for getting this to work. Well, possible values is not going to work for like a small-ish sample. That's right. That's right. Um, plausible, you, to make plausible values look better, you'd have to plausible values the parameters. Yeah. And then you'd have to do the process of sampling both simultaneously. Which is, I mean, again, I could, I could probably code that in R2 because there's a, when the parameters come out, there's a variance, covariance matrix of them, and you draw a sample of it from it. There's still another source of error that's getting into the weeds that that variance, covariance matrix is based on the, the sample size, and if the sample size is small, it's going to be underestimated as well. So Bayesian is probably the easiest way to go. Yeah. Okay. So now how do you, and I didn't teach you Bayesian in this class. I struggle with. Because I do, I do a lot of Bayesian in a lot of the research I do, and I'm not doing Bayesian because of like a lot of people believe in Bayesian, which is I've got priors and whatever. Because priors are to me really difficult to pick. I do it because I have a lot of high dimensional problems, or I have small data, or I have something else, and it gives me more of the wiggle. It's it doesn't rely on in maximum likelihood. We always said in the limit, or as n goes to infinity. Well, that's when a posterior distribution gets formed in Bayesian, which is the parameter estimates you have, you're not relying on that as much. So that's why I like it a little bit better. But what I struggle with is I can't teach this class only in Bayesian because most of the journal articles you're going to read aren't going to talk about it in Bayesian terms. Right? So then I'm like, well, can I teach a Bayesian version of this class? Actually, Billy Skrupski and I have been, they were talking about that. It's like, oh, maybe next fall I should teach... What I'm going to call Bayesian psychometric models. I floated that day. It's like, yeah, how many people would take that class? Really? No, we have a lot of small sample sizes, so we need to know how to do these things. This is good to hear, because like Lisa tells me, oh, there'll be like three people who take it. No, wait, I mean, there's been a, a science that doesn't have those huge data sets. Like all of us, for yeah. the most part. With except, yeah. Sorry, not all of us. I shouldn't say that. If you work at CETE, <laughs> <laughs> you effectively have large data sets, but... We have a faculty member, mm -hmm. not a professor, but a faculty member who does that Bayesian, and we invited him. Tyler. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, we invited him to talk about Bayesian. He's great. No, I, uh, Tyler uh, Hicks. Yes. Yeah, but there is no class. No. I mean, that's the thing that we don't And there's a Bayesian class, but it doesn't get deep into the models. Yeah. And then when I look at this, what I don't know enough of, and that's where I also wanted to teach it, was... If I push my research this way, if you think of all the things you have to do to verify model fit in maximum likelihood, seeing the Bayesian analog that is harder for a lot of the models that we have. Now, I think in SEM, the CFA models, I think we can do it. Uh, and people have, but like the IRT models, it's a little different. So, but so you'd find value in the class like that. So if I'm over here, I'm struggling because I'm like, I'm teaching one class I think in the fall. 
being an associate chair. I'm like, what should it be? Should it be regression? And every time I talk about that, I'm like, ooh, yeah, but I could, I could really give everybody a good start. Oh, I mean, because I believe in myself and I shouldn't be so arrogant. But you know what I'm saying? I have the chance to understand the issues in teaching regression. How's that sound? Uh, but then... New class that can be really useful. Right. Well, and that's the thing. Like um, the book, there's a book by Roy Levy and Bob Mislevy that just came out. Bob Mislevy, by the way, is the guy who gave us the NAEP article back in the 90s about the plausible values. Um, bright people. And it's called Bayesian Psychometric Models. And I think it's totally cool, but it's written for like the technical side. I'm like, well, no, I want that for the user side. Like I want to do that for people who are not just technical, but also practitioner based. And so so yeah, I want that. So yeah, maybe I'll do that. Then. Hearing this feedback's good. I'll I'll report this. Billy and I, I was trying to get his feedback. Like what, as a program member, what's valuable to be taught? Well, yeah, maybe that. Huh? So you, I mean, I'm not. You don't have to guarantee. There's no, no compulsion to sign up now. But if you had the opportunity to take it, having taken this class, you would. I mean, we talk about it a lot. Yeah. But we don't have like something that will give us the opportunity to learn it, but okay. then also learn how to apply it. And so cool. basically this class, but, but with Bayes all the way rather than, hey, remember ML. Yeah, it's, this curve does that, it's next thing. Yeah, it is, It's and it, and then Plus has switched over to it almost completely. Uh, you know, they have an estimator that's option for it too. So yeah, I'd like to do that. So maybe I'll take this information back and maybe you're convincing me. Of course, thinking every time I think about teaching stuff, I'm like, should I teach that? I'm really, for whatever reason, this decision just lingers in my head. Well, oh, I really want to. Bayesian. Bayesian. Because you need to seven people. Oh, yeah. I mean, and the thing is, I probably could argue I'd get by with three. <laughs> but I don't, I don't. Easily. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think, I think broadly, I think people in campus, and I'm not trying to replace like Billy's Bayesian class. It's more, his class goes into more of the Bayesian theory and less, less deep into these models. It'll be the opposite. It'll be, here's enough Bayesian that you need to know to understand the output. But let's talk about the issues that go into estimating the models. How do you check it's converged? Yeah. What does the output mean? And then finally this. Yeah. Wait, and then, wait, you said regression. Right? No, I would do uh, psychometric, like CFA and IRT and SEM, the big, like this class, but in days. And actually, I wrote an email to, so I know Roy. He's a, I would, I would, I, I, I'm friendly with him. I don't know him that well, but he came to give a talk on campus. And we hung out a little bit here. And, um, Send him an email, you know, about another topic, and then uh, mention I liked his book. And I said, "Have you like when we? I'm struggling with like if we think of our curriculum. There's only so many ways that we can teach these classes. And every time I teach this, I'm like, God, I wish I'd been doing this in Bayes. Should I just flip everything over to Bayes? And like Billy and I would totally agree with that. But then that's going to hurt you because if you're reading the ML based result, yeah, it's hard because this is like helpful for us to interpret." You know what we're reading now, mm -hmm. but thinking about future analyses that we're going to do, especially in, in our field, it's like that's the direction. Cool. So we're like ill informed on what we're going to be doing, but we're very informed on what's happening right now. So informally, how many of you might be interested? Not guaranteed, but interested if the course would work. Cool to hear. Cool Katie to hear. Yeah, Katie. Katie. Yeah. All right. Yeah. <laughs> okay, it's good to hear because uh, again, there's no I no commitment needed. It's more just I, I asked my SEM class and like over half said yeah. I thought that would be that's good feedback because then I'm probably going to get five or six people. Mm -hmm. And that would be for next fall. Yeah. Mm -hmm. As long as you record it. Oh, it'll be it'll be recorded. <laughs> yeah, I know you're. you're Is an hour and 15 minutes. Yeah. Like yeah. Like what do you guys like about that? Let me ask. I like. What? No, I like two. No, it's all. Uh, okay, let's. let's <laughs> this is, by the way, there's no right answer, and I've done it both ways. I like two. If you like two, raise your hand. If you like one, raise your hand. Okay. From the, like, I, I like two, bit. but from a counseling psych standpoint, like with practicum. Yes, and GRAs, it's hard to it's get like, them to fit, right? Yeah. Like, but if I wasn't where I was in my program, I could not have taken the class with the two separate things. And, and I'm sensitive to that too. And I agree. Like, it's hard to get it all in. The issue I have is like the, at some point, with this, the stuff gets complicated. I hit a wall. Like, if I'm sitting. Yeah. If I'm sitting there, I'm like. I agree. Oh my God. Okay. You're going to show me another equation. <laughs> and we're two hours into my class, right? And believe me, I, I can talk about this stuff all day. It's not me hitting the wall, right? But I feel like we get cut off a lot. You know, 
I think that's my that's my thing, and I like that I can like just think about this for two and a half hours. Okay. Okay. Well, um, and the thing is, I can also try to circulate it. Um, I'll tell you what. When I go to think about putting this class on the books, I'll send everybody in this class since I have your email still. I'll send an email, and to those of you who are interested, reply, and then tell me kind of like. Like I don't know the 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 schedule for you guys in in, in sped, but I don't and, and anybody who's not in I think everybody else is EPR for the most part, right? Or some of you might also be joint with um, other programs. So I don't. It's harder to do that. I know I when um, when I put this class on, I actually sent an email to the counseling side of EPR at uh, Psych and school and said, hey, and then it was it was hard to find too. So yeah, because even difficult. watching the video, it is hard, yeah. <laughs> it's two and a half hours. It's not manageable to watch it. No, you have to break it up. Yeah. Yeah, and I think that's that's definitely it. Um, so I got to think that anyway. So this back to SEM for this class. Big solution is Bayes, but if you're going to do Bayes, <laughs> here's the funny thing. It's actually if you're going to put it all together in Bayes, I think it's actually ironically easier to get back to the full SEM because in Bayes. When things start to break or not converge well, the way that we sort of trick it into converging more is to put more information into the priors and things start to converge. So ironically, when you go to Bayes, it's a remedy for the, the circumventing the breaking of the algorithm, but it doesn't have as many broken algorithms. <laughs> Does that make sense? At least in my experience. I don't know if that's true of everybody. but All right. Um, the other cool thing about if I do Bayes is it's right there with my research program, like right now. And I kind of want to write a book about it. So it's it's all tied together. I'm like, this is this is it. What's that? And with a Friday of shops as well. Yeah, that'll be, I don't know if I'm, who knows what next year is. They, they may kick me out. or I don't know that I actually have time to do CRMDA next year. But we'll see. We'll see. I might be able to. It all depends. Um depends on who becomes department chair of EPSY also. So if that were to be me, um, then my summer's paid for and they have no place they can pay me to do that and I have no time to do it. All right, so anyway. All right. Thank you, everybody. It's been a great semester. Let me applaud you. I really enjoyed, I enjoyed this small, I feel like this room helped foster a better I felt like we were all close so we could talk better. It wasn't a distance thing, so maybe I'll try to put the Bayesian psychometrics right here. Mm -hmm. That'd be good. And try to recreate this. Um, but thank you all. Um, I appreciate it. And again, if this is not just the end. If you have questions about research, and I have time to help, uh, that's part of the... Sorry. <laughs> there are ways I can help with pointed questions. There, I'm less able to do things that take a lot longer time, but you know, 15-minute help or something like that, I'm able to help. Certainly contact me, uh, anything you need. So it's great having you as class. And if you haven't rated me yet, get full first. And then <laughs> 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 Thank you. No, no. Thanks, everyone. Have a good, uh, uh, good winter break. Hopefully it's a good break for you.